But before we commence, our discussion of plays quite far from here, though close to the heart of many of us. Um, I wish to begin by acknowledging the people of the Kulin Nation on whose land we gather today and pay our respects to their elders past and present. So it's just so wonderful to see so many of you here tonight. No doubt drawn to the fabulous lineup of speakers that we have here waiting to share stories uh, about Jakarta from the 1950s and 60s. And I expect also that you might have been attracted to the great photo that we use on our flyer for this seminar, which is courtesy of Elsa Bunyuden, who is here tonight with his colleagues. <laughs> and who is also the star of the photo there, with a wonderful hat, you can get set together with Betty and her feet, Jailani and Etcha, with whom the feet that Elsa lived at Jalan Hollywood in the high run in the mid 1950s. And indeed, our first speaker, Scott Merrily, will take us. Back to precisely the moment in Jakarta's history when this image was taken, uh, as he paints a picture for us of her and Betty Speed's Jakarta of the 1950s. I won't do bios for our speakers because I think you've got to for yourselves and you probably will already have done. Um, I'll just introduce Scott and get on with the show. In the early 1980s, and great uh, without speaking to this platform to begin with. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, spending 22 years living in Chicago, uh, until the end of 2013, and developed a deep fascination uh, with uh, the development of the city, the physical landscape of the city, how the city evolved, what it used to look like, how it developed, you know, why it developed, what were the influences which caused it to change. And I've, uh, I've done three books over the last 15 years which surveyed the development of Chicago in the middle of the 19th century. And uh, the first, the third book, the most recent book, is the one you see here, Chicago Portraits of the Capital, 1950 to 1980. And when I was finishing this book, I had the great pleasure of reading uh, Jimmy's wonderful biography of Bernard Feet, and of course, it's sort of overlap because the first chapter in my book covers the 1950s, and of course, her, uh, his first two terms in Chicago were 1951-53, and then of course, after a 12 months break back here in Melbourne, 1954 to 1956. So, uh, um, I thought, given that uh, Gemma is someone who focused on the activities of life of her and Betty in Jakarta and what they were doing uh, in, the, in, the, in Jakarta, I, I would focus on what the city actually looked like and what her and Betty, Betty Fee's Jakarta uh, looked like at the time uh, they were there. Um, my first uh, two books, uh, which you see here, the one on the left covers the uh, second half of the 19th century. And the one on the right, the first half of the 20th century. So, since all, all three books are a continuation of, of each other. Uh, let's look at the map of Jakarta in, in 1950. This was published in 1952, but shows Jakarta uh, early 1950 before the, the, the boundary was expanded. This boundary was expanded in March 1950. Uh, a few interesting things to note. Um, for a start, Kewer and Baru is not even in Jakarta. Kewer and Baru was developed as a satellite city outside of Jakarta. It wasn't until the border was expanded in the March 1950, Kewer and Baru became uh, part of Jakarta. Uh, there's no Jalan Tamrin, there's no Jalan General Sudirman, uh, because they hadn't been built yet or work on them had just started uh, when this map uh, uh, was, was put together. You can see Jakarta in 1950 was, of course, the city inherited from the colonial uh, era. Uh, you can see on the eastern side of the city, uh, Kilayana Airport, of course, is the international airport. If we look at the southern part of the map in more detail, there again, Kilayana Maru, uh, a satellite city. Uh, outside the borders of the city. Of course, this map uh, is really only uh, 18 months before her arrived in, in Jakarta, so it's, it's very much the Jakarta thing to see. Because Menteng is here, uh, Menteng uh, was really a satellite city itself when it was built back in the 1910s. And um, so, uh, no Jalan Tangri, no Jalan General City, uh, a very different city. In fact, I, I really felt the development of Jakarta has evolved in three very distinct stages. You have the, the VOC, Jakarta, 1619 to 1799, that was a company town. You then had the 
Dutch colonial city, which is really this area here. The third stage of the city of Jakarta didn't really get going until the very early 1960s, uh, which is outside the gamut of this talk. But we're looking at Jakarta here where there's been no Tamiyan, no Sumerian, no Bank Indonesia building on Tamiyan, no Sumangi, no Sumayan, no Sabina, no Hotel Indonesia. Uh, it was a very, very different, uh, very, very different. But obviously, uh, Jakarta or Indonesia became independent, so a lot of the old Dutch buildings uh, obviously became very important symbols for the new Indonesian leaders. Uh, here we have, of course, uh, the presidential palace, which had been built in 1879 as the Governor General's Palace. There is President Soprano himself watching a very nice parade. So obviously, this was where on the 27th of December 1949, 18 months before. Very fees arrived, the, uh, the Dutch flag was lowered and the, the Indonesian flag was, was raised for the first time. So very, very symbolic that you now have an Indonesian president or a Dutch governor general. I can imagine how excited the would have been uh, being there at the very beginning of it all. Another building possibly her visited was the first parliament uh, on Zubangabanti Timor, which of course was the old uh, Concordia Military Society. It was a, a club, a social club for uh, Dutch or European uh, army officers. Uh, obviously, in modern Indonesia, it becomes an Indonesian building and again very symbolic as the parliament between 1950 and 1965. I'm sure, as we see in Gemma's book, uh, her had regular contact with the members of parliament uh, in what was obviously the important parliamentary democracy phase of Indonesia in the first half of the 1950s. Uh, her may well have uh, visited this building to meet some of the members of parliament he was talking to. Uh, sadly, no longer exists. It was demolished to make way for the Ministry of Defence building. Another very symbolic building where uh, the Volksrat, of course, used to hold its meetings. Uh, the Volksrat were, of course, the, the People's Council, where Indonesians like Muhammad Husni Khan were, were minorities uh, in their own country. Uh, Obviously, after uh, independence, it becomes an important building, and of course, becomes the the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Of course, it's here where uh, Sukarno already has famous uh, uh, Pontius Silas speech, or possibly didn't read it, but uh, um, this spoke off the top of his head. Of course, this building is still here, again, very symbolic as the little Pontius Silas. Um, where did Herb actually work? And the next two photographs are not from my uh, book. Uh, we know from Gemma's work that uh, Herb worked for the, uh, the Ministry of uh, Information. And their head office uh, was actually a bed at the Bekabara, one explained, place number nine, uh, which is this building here, a lovely colonial building which dates back to at least the 1860s, it was owned by the Arafun family. In the 1860s, a wealthy uh, family of Armenian merchants. So you can see here, Kumatri Ambarangan, Ministry of Information. Uh, now, we can only presume that Herb worked in this building, but um, here's the same building again when it was the German consul between 1911 and 1914. Uh, lovely, lovely building. Imagine you couldn't fit that many people in it, and obviously um, ministries were smaller in those days. Uh, but this is probably the building that uh, Herbert was Molly Wanda uh, looked after her in the early days. Sorry, looked after her in the early days would have, uh, would have worked. Um, sadly, no longer exists. Uh, in, 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 we again see from uh, Gemma's book that uh, at the beginning of her second tour of duty in Chicago, he was impressed by some of the modern buildings. In fact, quoting from page 157 of Gemma's book where in fact she quotes from uh, a letter that Herb wrote. Uh, Herb was impressed with the large number of new buildings, mostly public buildings, <coughs> as quote, quite staggering in both size and architectural style. Australia has very few that can compare with some of them. I imagine this would be one of the buildings he was referring to. This is the Ministry of Agriculture building. I see Hugh and architect there smiling in the front. Uh, it doesn't do a lot to me architecturally. Um, but it was uh, possibly one of the imposing buildings that, um, that uh, Herb was writing about in, in the mid-1950s. It's now the General Election Commission building, um, still designed by a Dutch architect. It 
wasn't really until uh, the very, very early 1960s in Chicago that we began to see the work in Indonesia now from this version. But this is the Dutch architect of Melling. Uh, and this is probably one of the modern buildings of Jalanina Bonjol, which, uh, which Herb was uh, uh, referring to. Right. We know where Herb lived. Herb lived in Kiliana Maru. Of course, a satellite city where development really only started in the late 1940s, early 1950s. So Herb was moving into uh, Molly Bondan's house. Molly herself had moved into Kiliana Maru in October 1950. And Molly's wonderful uh, biography written by her brother and another person after she passed away. She noted um, that Kiliana Bardo, although now it's of course central Jakarta and together with Benteng, the two most valuable suburbs in, in Jakarta in terms of land values, um, Molly, uh, in the book um, of Molly Bondan, it mentions people didn't like Kiliana Bardo. Because water was in short supply and it was very quiet at night, since only a few houses had been built. There were no doctors or chemists, no public buses, and not even one single would have moved there. We traveled to and from work every day on the buses and trucks the government supplied for its employees. The first school was only just being built, and people traveled by bedchuck or horse from Dokkan to visit friends in the old area or to go to the nearest market to Kyoya the Lama. We thought the air was fresher and cleaner than close to the city. Which is an interesting observation, of course, no one would say the air in Kamara Bada now was fresh and clear. But Molly moved in there in, in October 1950. Uh, her followed uh, in uh, June or July 1951. Now, these photographs are from mid 1950s, so a bit more development has taken place. But clearly, uh, we're talking about Kamara Bada at very, very early stages. This is the Residents of the Norwegian honorary consul. So, Herb used to ride his bike um, from Kiwaira Maru up to his workplace at uh, presumably the building we just showed you a little while ago. And um, that would have been a, a very, very pleasant journey, one would imagine, back in the 1950s uh, when Kiwaira, when uh, Sevierman and Herman uh, were still very, 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 very quiet and clean. Of course, uh, Herb and Betty would have seen a lot of things we can't not no longer see in Jakarta anymore. The, the Harmony Club uh, in 1954, when Herb was there, became the Jakarta Club. Uh, of course, open to Indonesians naturally after independence, whereas it hadn't been uh, before independence. We have here the, the Harmony Junction, of course, Jalan Veteran, Jalan Duwanda, Jalan Mazubay. Um, very much an important center of of life and activity in Jakarta in most of the early 50s and 60s. Um, nothing had moved south to Tumbrian or Sudirman yet because Tumbrian and Sudirman barely existed. Uh, so they were very important. Um, here we're looking at essentially, this is looking at the Harmony Junction, from the Harmony Junction looking south down the Dubai. This next one is looking at the Harmony Junction north. This is Jalan Gajimada, Jalan Hayaburu, uh, the BTM building, the Postcard Bank, the Hotel and Gallery. Again, quite quite busy, a few bed chucks there as well. We don't see those in Jakarta anymore. A few trees as well, we don't see trees in Jakarta. <laughs> uh, but that, that's again, a very, very busy, important uh, junction. This is again um, uh, looking towards the Harmony building, looking south to the Jalan Haya Mudal here, Jalan Red and Mother there. Because no one would believe that's now Jalan Red and Mother. Behind these lovely trees was the Hotel Zen, the, the grandest hotel in Indonesia and one of the most famous hotels uh, in Jakarta, sadly demolished in 1972. But of course, uh, my good friends, uh, Dr. David and Ruti Mitchell were married here uh, in, shall I mention, 1968. Uh, so, not giving away your age, and sadly, David and Sorry? You weren't there as well. But um, sadly, I mean, having this was allowed to survive, it would be the Indo-Asian or the, the Strand or the Eastern and Oriental of, of Jakarta. But sadly, we lost it and we have to do the Berlin complex uh, instead, which is, which is very tragic. Never been, a lot of, lot of questions which have never been properly answered about the fate of the 
Now, this is Jalan Juwanda, uh, looking at Pasar Baru in this direction, and Rohani Jamish in this direction. Again, because you didn't have the, the stage three view plan, the sunrise, the Sudirmans, the modern hotels, the modern malls, the modern shopping areas in the 50s. So this was taken in the late 50s. So you've got your airline offices, your bookstore, the Landolf bookstore, uh, a lot of boutiques, uh, restaurants, cafes along Jalan Juwanda. The, the Dutch name back in the colonial era was, was Nordic. And even when I first went to Jakarta, there was still a restaurant Nordic on Jalan Juwanda, which was closed shortly after. Uh, I, uh, I saw it, but um, uh, people who were familiar with Jakarta in the 50s and 60s will recall this was a very fashionable shopping area. It had been one of the main shopping areas for Europeans in, in, the, in the colonial era and continued really through up until the 70s. And of course, as new hotels opened and new shopping malls opened, uh, it, was, it was overtaken. This bookstore here, we can see. Here, this lovely picture, the Van Gogh bookstore, the Jalap Lechimonga, Jalap Luanda, a very old bookseller uh, in Samarang, Surabaya, in Bandung, it didn't get to Jakarta until much later, until the 1940s, but they built this beautiful Art Deco bookstore. Possibly some of you may have bought books there, possibly yourself, you have a few And uh, that's now a Toyota showroom, so I think it's a large amount of Toyota showroom. It's a lovely example of architecture that this has been lost. An area close to Hughes Heart would have been Pasar Baru. Very much in its heyday in the 1950s. Really from the 1960s, 70s that began to, 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 to fall out of favor. But this was really an area, the middle classes in the Baku shop. Uh, it was interracial. It wasn't like Lodok where the Chinese were or, uh, uh, or, or Pasar Sudan, which was predominantly Chinese. Europeans, you had Chinese, you had Indians, uh, Europeans, it was a very, very interracial, popular, middle to upper middle shopping area, and uh, again, the bed chucks and the, lots of traffic. Pasar Sunen, uh, of course, this is the second king of Sunen, right now, Pasar Sunen here, again, very different. I think uh, Charles will be talking about Sunen later on. Notice the trams, of course. Uh, Jakarta had a tramway system from 1869 up until 1960, so almost 100 years. Sadly, uh, this is when traffic problems are becoming intolerable now in Jakarta. There's no tramway system anymore. It was cheap, it was popular, uh, but Bum Karno uh, didn't think it fitted into the modern image he had of Jakarta. He wanted to create in the 60s. The tram, the last tram service from Sudan through the Japanese Island was closed. Uh, in, I think, April 1962, which is a few months before the Asian Games starts. And uh, you don't see, and maybe you remember the trams, but uh, sadly they're no longer part of the trams. Again, the other important market, that Glodok. Again, trams again, the trams are everywhere. Uh, this is the Glodok market, it's still large in the same story in the 1950s. And um, Jalan Panchura, and uh, this was replaced by the uh, the city hotel building, which was uh, basically badly damaged by fire in the uh, 1998 riots. Mm -hmm. In the trams are everywhere. We used to the market, we used to the trams. This is a lovely picture. Trim Young for No Jakarta. Obviously, you can see they were very, very popular. There's a story going now that some people believe that now, after 1945, because Indonesia was now independent, that means people didn't have to pay the tram. Uh, this is one of the contributing factors, actually, to the financial decline of the, uh, the tram, apart from the fact that Paul Carroll didn't want to be in the bottom of the city either. Uh, uh, a feature which is not often focused on, if you look at the history of Indonesia, is, is the political independence versus the economic independence. Indonesia obviously achieved political independence in 1945, it wasn't recognized by the Dutch until 1949. But the Dutch still controlled very, very significant segments of the economy up until uh, the late 1950s. So when, when her and Betty Friedman were there on both of their tours of duty, uh, the, the, the banking system was Dutch controlled. Big four banks, this one is the Ed Harlem, Netherlands Harlem's Master Bank. 
started as a trading company but became a bank when we saw. Very, very important. Still Dutch controlled up until about 1960. Uh, you can see here, on the top of the chart here, we, we, can, we know when this photograph was taken, it would have been around 1957, when the Irian crisis was very much in people's minds because you had uh, uh, Belanda Rampok, uh, or Milik Air E, or Usir Belanda in Indonesia, uh, basically being painted on the outside of, of this building. So, really, really tensions were getting very, very high in, in 1957. So the banking sector was still that control for the many of them. The oil sector was still controlled. The Latash Petroleum Nazca by FAM, which is the forerunner of Puerto Mina, or Puerto Mina, which was the Puerto Mina, again with over banking for there, under Dutch control. Uh, and of course this building is now Puerto Mina, it's on the corner of Java and Javier and Java and Java and Java and Java and Java and Java. So oil is under Dutch control. And of course, inter island shipping, the shipping industry was under Dutch control. The Cafe Hymn and Kodolithia Pakenbach must have been. This was quite significant because this was, there, there was a strike uh, and, and a, a demonstration outside this very building of Jalan Mena in December 1957, which precipitated the entire nationalization process and the expulsion of the Dutch. It was in front of this building where the, the trade union basically went into the President directed the CEO and said, Well, we are now taking over this company. This is now belongs to Indonesia. And so, um, so at the moment, time, the Dutch presence in the economy was still strong. In 1952, there were about 49,000 foreigners, excluding Chinese, in Jakarta, of which 43,000 were Dutch. By 1960, there were about 300. So that period, late 1957 through 1960, uh, about 98% of the Dutch uh, had left. And Indonesia had rightly taken control of its own economy. Um, only a, a few, five more slides to go, I think. Uh, Berg, of course, arrived by ship. And we have a nice account in Jimmer's book of Herb that uh, Herb's travels from Australia to uh, Jakarta. He was met by Molly Bondan. And from Priok, and around here. And of course, look how empty this is here. I'm sure it's lately built here, and it's sort of like the old railway station, so it be somewhere around here. Of course, still very, very empty, so no doubt uh, Bobby would have met her somewhere around here, possibly, if that was the ship, or taken the railway all the way to uh, that way through the Mayora, or just leave the top of the town there. It'd be fascinating way to travel. I was too young to do it. But that's the we have, of course, Kimayoran Airport, which opened in 1940. Beautifully timed as the Japanese arrived in March 1942, so basically a whole new airport came to be just in time for the Japanese invasion. Um, uh, but this was uh, the domestic and uh, international airport up until 1974, when uh, the international groups were redeveloped Harlem. I recall my first trip to Indonesia in 1981, and I arrived at Harlem. And of course, both uh, were relocated to Kranahata in 1985. But presumably, Herb would have made a few flights out of there, unless because he was such a penniless member of the graduate volunteers program, he couldn't afford it. He, he took a bus, but clearly that was an important uh, landmark in, in Japan. Um, but life is not all work. Um, the Metropole Theatre uh, opened about two or three months before Herb arrived. This is now Jakarta's. Second oldest center in Mendy, opened in April 1951. Uh, Annie Gets Your Guns is the first movie to play there. Uh, and Herb had arrived uh, two or three months after it was opened and presumably enjoyed a few uh, movies there, all his Betty. And uh, that's still there now as the second oldest center uh, in Jakarta. Another cinema possibly Herb might not have visited was the cafe. Uh, but I, I put this here because it was built in 1954, again, during a time which uh, the Herb was yes, very active. So, uh, Jalan Gunung uh, Sahari no longer exists, but uh, this is where the first Indonesian Film Festival was held in 1955. In fact, the Metropole and the Cafe, they both co hosted the first Indonesian Film Festival in 1955, and Herb and Metro both of them in Jakarta, and they well attended the Film Festival. And of 
course, who could imagine going to a swim in one of Jakarta's beaches? Yeah? Uh, not recommended for the health these days. Uh, but in the 1950s, uh, Chilinchi, uh, some of you, of course, may have visited there in your later years, a great place to go, uh, a bit of boating, a bit of uh, uh, swimming, uh, <coughs> lovely farm lion beaches. Uh, there's tons of free outlets now here, further towards the east. Papa uh, is further over there towards the west. This became supplanted when Anshal was developed in the late 60s and 1970s. So Chilichi basically uh, became uh, uh, somewhat superseded. Sadly, now it's a very polluted slum. Uh, but clearly, back in the 1950s, it was a very popular uh, and low cost form of uh, weekend entertainment, possibly the urban very, very well expensive kind of Chilichi. As indeed may, as indeed may, many of you. So I think I'm running out of time. And um, so thank you very much for that. And, uh, well, we can save our questions for the end and have all three of our speakers together. That's going to be wonderful. So, our next speaker is um, Hugh O'Neill. He needs no introduction at all. And Hugh's going to talk to us about when he first arrived in Cairo in the late 1950s through to the early 1960s. I got a full three of course. And I uh, I'm just looking at these slides again. They bring so much much to them. It's impossible. Every every almost every picture they had I saw was I was at Lady Judy's wedding <laughs> and and I've been with most of those places. I know them very well of course. It's when you get old, it's really extraordinary because those memories get rather than the bit of those I'm not going to talk about architecture, it's my too much. Because I really, it's all about her and her young people. Because her talk to the SCM and Tom and Sarah, Top H, and Point Longstone, and Betty was there too, about being in Jakarta and after I had this week. I, I wanted to go somewhere that was as far away from M Melbourne as possible <laughs> and was culturally as well as physically. And it wasn't physical, it was very close for me. And here was an opportunity where the government paid to go there. So I immediately said I'd like to go. And I was only in third year. And uh, uh, there were five years, and then we had to do two years before you went. You had to have two years of practice after practice to be a volunteer. So I, um, I used to go and see Jim Webb, who was the warden of the evening. I had to get out my notes. And oh. Oh, <laughs> So really, my whole life, this, uh, first semester this year, I was teaching. Uh, a five year sign class on uh, working on heritage in Patahila, the old central old branch. Since that meeting down at Top H, and until now, it's been an obsession. And uh, even, even I was asked to start a course in uh, the Architecture of Asian Society in 1962. Just after I'd been appointed to the Melbourne University Selector. And it was the first, uh, one of my students was such a professor of architecture at Harvard, said there's no such thing in Australia. And um, it was certainly the first in Australia. And that's a long story. There's so many long stories I'm going to get for you. I'm visiting to my notes. I was doing the working drawings for the International House in 1953 at that time. And the university was very focused on, on the Asian students coming through to uh, the two time of that. And I knew them, of course. Some very bright people who came top this year. So, uh, 
Is that the truth? <laughs> Good to you then, the moment is not possible. <laughs> so, in uh, 58, that uh, Jim, uh, the cable came from Canberra, and I've been working away, designing uh, all sorts of buildings and like making some money to have some, and I finished in an edition. Because we weren't allowed to take any money to an edition. And that was the genius about this, this uh, tour and program that was devised by uh, Ben and Tom Nick and uh, all of the LA. And um, that's what the Americans didn't understand at all. Because when, when uh, Tom Anderson went to, and who was from to uh, Washington, when Kennedy was putting together the Peace Corps in the early 60s, the beginning of 60s. They didn't get this at all because they were all paid by the American government. And of course, it became infamous for interference in local affairs in other countries. But we were totally the home to the English government. Harvard on the uh, Oceania 2, the same ship, I think, it's the first original. And there were three, uh, one of them had students going home. One of them had done very well, but all the English students were going to the last job at RTB, engineering. Uh, another one was um, a player in the jumping, was a Sumatra. He was rather down in Dutch, and we all were bouncing on the ship back home. And another one who failed this district at uh, Sydney University, Sydney Tech, Melbourne University, Melbourne Tech, but he bought a hold of them. And uh, he had great time. <laughs> and, uh, he called himself Harun al Rashid. <laughs> and uh, while he was working in Jakarta, for his Holden to come from another ship. He came up to see me and I thought, thinking that I might have good connections for him. But I haven't seen him since, but I did hear <laughs> that he'd done very well somewhere in that country. <laughs> and we, we pulled in there and um, I had two pounds on him and I knew I shouldn't have any money, so I gave one pound ten shillings to the uh, one of the stewards with my parents' tradition, I never got it. I had 10 children said, when I was going through, uh, a bloke with a gun on his shoulder said, you've got your money, I said, yes, I have. Um, I've got 10 children, so you better give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave it to him, and I didn't know where he was going to push out. One cat was working with me, the film was with him, I wonder where it should be. Nice to see him. Um, he said, oh, what? And I realised later that the street exchange was John Gare looked after me. Sorry, he's not here. He was a very important person in my life because he found a job for me. I think other people helped. In fact, Jamie Mackey, uh, the day I left my office in East Melbourne, the office of Ray Bergen, Ray Bergen actually was a lecturer at the moment, um, he said, Oh, a friend of yours is coming tomorrow. Uh, he wants to build a house. And it was Jack, he'd just come back, and uh, I'd never met him, but he knew me because of fun um, now, not because of that. He may have helped get the job for me, but he, he was um, uh, right there at the end, too. <coughs> so John took me to Dublin, which is in the drum up there. We've just seen the trams at uh, San Antonio, uh, just down the road a bit past Miss Chichi. That's an amazing sort of place, Miss Chichi was. I, I did have a go, but it was an amazing run of entertainment. And we sat on the veranda outside the office, and the boss came out, and I didn't speak in English, but not very much at all. And the conversation was about the arrangement that they made for me to come to work for a couple of years with, um, at, at, at the housing office. And uh, after a while, the, the boss went back into the building and John turned to me and he said, You can't do anything to me about you. <laughs> <laughs> and it, was, it was something like oh, six years since I'd come back. And I've been waiting, working, anticipating. And anyway, they're down at the desk for me. And the first day, the next day when I went in, I was walking down the center for very simple things for a building. And I heard this extraordinary exclamation behind me. And I turned around and he spat at me. And he's, he's swearing at me in Dutch. It was always said in English that he's not to swear really well. He had to use Dutch. And, but normally, if I met people in the street, they, uh, 
and then they pumped it up into that canal I put it out for, where it ran by gravity right around somewhere near Kuwait, the west of Kuwait, and then they did that pump the water up into the sea there. But of course, after uh, almost 10 years since the Dutch were in control, things hadn't worked so well from that point of view. And so it was up to your knees to do any work from down for and up in the evening, and it was common after that. And then everybody had been up and been up on top of with their uh, nets and with frogs. It was really so true. There were so many companies in mind, people selling things and, and rattling things and this and things like that. And they, they had offering to help. It was a very, very difficult year. The population of Jakarta and Oriata, I was telling you exactly how many people were living here. They, they, they're just becoming very, very grand. Anyway, I suppose I should talk about this briefly. I'm not sure whether that building with the blue is just showed there. That building there, I think, is the Australian it is. Embassy, isn't it? And um, most extraordinary. I moved to Bundle after about three months with the same one teach. And the same uh, great friend, in fact, the, the daughter, Maya, the younger daughter. Mary was the only son of the Italian Mongolians who I lived with. So I was in family uh, between the Jakarta and Bundle. And uh, one of uh, Takari Mongolians' greatest friends was Mr. Zin, who lived on the way up to Denmark. And I think he may have been poorish, defeated in the a long time, I don't know. But he invented a, um, a, a building block, which was um, made out of a volcanic ash. And uh, it was very well known and used at the moment. Mr. Zinn was employed, he was living in Croydon Road um, by the time they started building this just before the Gangle Road began to go. Was it 64? It was starting to straighten him. I think. I think. Who designed it? I don't know. She was the problem with Captain Arkins. Mr. Zinn was put in charge of it all. Basically, I'll meet him. Anyway, my where I just designed the house for my sister and daughter. And he had to go back to the fortress down to the supervisor or he said they'd dump a load of screenings on the site in the morning and uh, in the afternoon and by the next morning it was all gone. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and of course they built it as a, a fortress really because the British Embassy was just out the field. It was one of the earlier buildings. In behind there, uh, it was uh, marauded because of the confrontation. And um, so they, they, they actually the British apartments were four cousins. But I should, uh, uh, again, another thing, um, we, I was taking a study of it in 67, and uh, Roman and myself and our five kids, probably it was not yet one. Arrived in Jakarta and the urban committee invited us to stay. And I read it, I just read it for wonderful. Um, how big those houses were, I, I knew it was difficult, but I was used to in the next and over the far end. But uh, Annie was there, she about the same age as And uh, we stayed only two nights before we left the London community in Jockey, where we were going to do. And the house down in Jockey was organised by my family and sister. He died not so long ago, in the 90s. And there was also one. And um, we arrived there, and, and Helen and Michael Cook. Michael Cook was the chef of at that time. And uh, Helen is uh, lives and his wife, and by this room in the pool, that was already operating since 1967, for seven months. How can we get on with that always? And um, they're all talking about other things that happened. Back into the forest through Jakarta. And um, then Bill Morrison was there, and they sort of didn't take the chicken, so he's out for the Sydney Morning Herald. He's one of our volunteers, I won't know, I'm sure he never know. Um, he happened to get a copy of that stuff, the German people, the Batman Egg, and the Jakarta's with Marcos. And uh, I had to go up to try and stop. And actually, throwing his bombs to get out. He did have to come home. 
which he was absolutely devoted to have in full of his work that he'd been doing any for a month or so. So it was a problem. And, and, and uh, Morrison was very annoyed. I was president of the, I was chair of the Australian Politics International. And um, he, he, uh, I sat down with him in his office. And he said, What's all this about? Who are you doing? And, uh, and, and so I talked to him. And then he said, Oh, what, what, are, you, what are you doing with me? So I said, Oh, I'm an architect. I told you, I told you, I told you. He said, Did you take the Chantan Moore down here by chance? I said, Yes. And I'm very quick. I mean, he said, Come with me. I said, Who's the moment? Oh, you could have his part in the end. So I'm back. This is, this is um, in 84, actually, and so it goes on. And then there's a leader, of course, no one was drawing on the book, and that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, I first went to, to live in Jakarta in April 1968, and then my Tanya and uh, our daughter Louisa were with me. Our first accommodation was at the Indonesian Council of Churches Guest House in Jalan Tukubuna, number 17. Andrew Soroman, the Guest House Director, met us at the airport. His Australian wife, Mary, ran the, 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 the office. Uh, this connection only came through her um, We nearly moved into a place in Jalan Raya, Mankin. Uh, Ibu Yos Nastani, a psychologist recommended by Mary Soroman, was looking for someone to lead to the least of the pavilion at the side of the house. We managed to extract ourselves from what would have been a costly commitment after we met up with the Akhiats at a party. They offered us a house for no more than what we were paying for our South Blackburn house, uh, and we could pay them in Australian money. It was occupied by Akhiats' younger brother, Donnie, who was about to move into a larger house. While we were waiting for him to move out and for some repair work to be done, we spent a fortnight with the De Rosari family in Jalan Kadiri, close to a football ground. Jim Taylor had stayed with them whilst doing field work for her Melbourne University master's thesis. The day before we moved to the Akyat house, we celebrated our daughter Louise's second birthday with the De Rosari family. The, place we, the places we'd lived in or considered were all in Nantek, which Scott in his uh, latest book tells us was developed during the 1920s as a planned garden suburb with modern infrastructure and facilities for Dutch civil servants and company employees. By 1968, it was populated by elite Indonesians and foreign diplomats. For example, General Masukion, <coughs> the Iraqi ambassador next door, Dr. Lenena, a long-term deputy prime minister, and the Australian ambassador were all neighbours in Jalan Kuruma. Our host in Jalan Kahiri was a former cabinet minister. Mente was a respectable and desirable part of Jakarta. Our new home at Gang Raja 6, number 7, was not. <laughs> Before enlarging on this, I want to quote from the letter I wrote to my parents four days after the moon, which, like so many letters home, passes over the less attractive features of our situation. <laughs> quote, the day after Louise's birthday was our shift from Mente to Tanatini, from the Derizari to the Akiyat House. Uh, I should have the familiar map. Uh, let me see. Uh, we were in the Mantang area, where are we here? Um, I want John to be here somebody. Never mind, somewhere in this area. And uh, we moved through Sanan, here we are, and out to the house here in Gangwajan. This is this little complex thing. You'll notice its relationship to Khmer and Airport. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> this is just south, as I was to say, I quote again from the letter, just south of Kumara Airport, and we hear every plane as it skims over our rooftop coming into land. And that's how people who visited us in this house dived under the table. <laughs> we were quite intuitive by that, and just sat there cheerfully in that book, and the plane was going to crash. Um, there's the cement junction. Another picture. If you wanted to go to uh, to from Semen out to the house, you take the road out to the right there in the last spot. Yes. Uh, sorry. 
right? yeah. over there, through and through there. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, it's uh, yeah, other one from that area. At that time, they were building this new Passa uh, Senem, Proyek Senem, it was known as at that stage. So that in the previous one, those houses in the middle, at the back of the thing, uh, were all demolished to make way for that, which was Passa Senem. Um, I wrote to my parents, it's a little like a Carlton or East Melbourne Terrace house. <laughs> <laughs> There it is. <laughs> Narrow frontage, walls on each side shared with neighbours, small back and front yards. It has cement tiles as floor throughout, and the rooms, though not huge, are quite nice and proportioned with reasonably high ceilings. Meta, as Meta, the Lewin, who then was now Meta Smith, has moved in with us, and we are hoping the people up here will bring back a slipper with her from Nandung tomorrow. For us, well, this is not the one that she brought back, but the one who spent most of the time in this room uh, who, uh, uh, in fact, travelled with us uh, when we travelled to Samara and Surabaya and Jogja later on. She rendered her first visit to a zoo in Surabaya. <laughs> to return to my later home, I then included a sketch of the floor plan of the house. Uh, I copied it on here, but it was very similar to that. Um, and I went on to say, living room one is a kind of sun porch. Glass windows on three sides, with window box plants all around. Living room two, rather nondescript, because virtually unfurnished. Living room three is the real living room. A sitting area with coffee table and four cane armchairs, and a dining area with table and four chairs. The fridge, and also the pan, usually grace this room as well. It has windows as well as glass door at the rear, overlooking the backyard. A few window box plants there too. Both bedrooms are off this living room. Meta and Louisa are in bedroom one, Tanya and I in bedroom two, in which I have a desk. The backyard has a more or less open drain, revolting, <laughs> water trough, kitchen table, and dresser. And Louisa is trying to tidy up the area near the drain. <laughs> A bathroom and WC, servers, quarters, and the kitchen. The whole place is small, but larger than we thought at first. It wasn't all wonderful. When we moved in, it was in a frightful mess. The wife of the previous occupant, up here's younger brother, had just come out of hospital, and little effort had been made to clean the house. In addition, workmen were still painting and cementing and doing odd jobs everywhere. It was all rather discouraging, as the work was promised to be completed before we moved in. The archaeologists were most embarrassed at the mess. Anyway, once in, we stayed and we have had workmen in and out ever since. Sunday has done it pretty strenuous without a servant, and Louisa chose this time to have her first illness in Indonesia. I'll skip the page about how we dealt with that. I went on. It's a relief to see her full of life again. But we're glad to find a competent doctor for our <coughs> needs locally, and the neighbors have all been very sympathetic and helpful. Now to the neighbors. We have a lot of them, and it's very close quarters. <laughs> That's Gangwaja, number six. And our house, uh, number seven in Gangwaja, number six, is there. We've seen the first one. Our house is in a gun or lane, barely wide enough for one car, with no footpath. The lane is in a complex of lanes, with houses mostly occupied by public servants. The only cars allowed to enter the complex are those owned by the residents, so there's a minimum of vehicular traffic. But the lane is rarely free of people. Lots of children, each family seems to have about six, who stand around and stare at Louisa and call out, Anna Putty, quite a job. <laughs> Neighbors themselves and sundry walkers. There she is, some of these other children. Um, now and again, a vetcher may come in with someone who's been shopping or to work, but usually even the vetcher stop outside the complex and you walk in and then you walk in. 
On Thursday, Don in Hatchett's brother took me to the houses of about a dozen of the nearest neighbors and introduced me, and in each we would sit and talk and eat the olive tea. The first to visit was the Ebte of Ubuntu Panga, who is the chairman of the neighborhood committee, a kind of vigilante organization found throughout the judicial since the coup. I think it's just just that much earlier. Every new resident in an area must report to the Ebte for that area and, in effect, register as a resident there. Foreigners are required by law to report to the police too, but apparently checking in with the FTA is sufficient. Well, not to avoid. Passports were inspected and names written into a book. It's a bit big brother like, but somehow in a context less so than I have feared. Perhaps it depends on who you are and the character of the particular FTA. House Suwaso of Takwaso to me is very nice and was a tremendous help on Saturday morning when Louisa was sick. He took me around looking for telephones and then went with me to find the doctor. Because I met so many of the neighbors in quick succession, I haven't got a clear picture of many of them yet. Two called in on Saturday morning, however, for a gossip and stayed several hours. <laughs> one of them, Lutty, a butcher, is in one of the houses adjoining ours. The other lives at the end of the lane. This chap, Kuzno, was most interesting. He's the chairman of Jakarta's equivalent of the Fair Rent Board. A lawyer by training. Like virtually everyone else in Indonesia, his salary is insufficient for the family's means, so he gets income in other ways. He has a friend who imports powdered milk and who lets him act as middleman. It all seems so incongruous. We had a pleasant evening chattering away in Indonesian with them, and they were full of offers of help of any sort. Transport. Stay overnight in my bungalow in Chipayo on the way to Bangkok and so on. And the orchids. Sold katan hitam and bubur kacangicho from house to house along the lane. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Louisa liked this and would go out to get a bowl filled. <laughs> a hawker also sold a Dutch style Swedish bread with chocolate sprinkles in it, wrapped in a recycle in recycled paper. It was rather surprising to discover the bread wrapped in a carbon copy of a leave application by a member of the Indonesian Marines. <laughs> to spare our parents' anxiety, we sent to many of the more insalubrious speeches of our situation. There were health risks. First of all, although we boiled all our drinking and cooking water, the proximity of the toilet to the water supply and the cracks in the cement between them probably accounted for a number of gastrointestinal problems. When I extended the length of our stay in Indonesia to a year, thanks to composing from Masters and PhD candidature, we negotiated with the Archives uh, to have uh, some further work done. But in, that improved things a lot. Especially the installation of a pump that could bring up groundwater at any time of the day. <clears throat> Secondly, the electrical wiring which ran through the patched ceiling was a fire hazard, not least because Donnie had arranged things so that the wiring bypassed the BLM fuse and so <laughs> on, thus enabling the occupants to have, as he put it, unlimited. <laughs> rather than the 150 watts total to which we were rationed. Without that arrangement, we could not have used the fan on the mini fridge, which were essential for our two year olds and not for ourselves. The temporary fuse that Donnie installed had such thick wire that it would probably have been the last part of the circuit to prevail in the castle. When we extended our stay, the Appiats replaced the patch with something less combustible and our uh, Friend Keith Smith, an engineer, later met his husband, made the electrical circuitry less hazardous, but not less legal, illegal. <laughs> Apart from safety considerations, we lived in fear of being caught stealing electricity in one of the numerous razzias or raids by Berlin inspectors who went around Jakarta, accompanied by members of all four armed forces. <laughs> Our young budget, number six, that is, was one of a number of lanes of the same name but a different number in the complex, surrounded by other streets, also with names of metals, Tambaga, Arundu, and Tima. The complex was actually pleasant and safe to live in, but it was quite literally located on the wrong side of the tracks. Paul Zulthausen, then doing his Monash PhD research on the army, told us that no one would ever visit us on that side of town, which certainly had a reputation for criminality and prosecution, 
<laughs> to get there from minting, you had to go by way of Pasa Cement, which we've seen in Dutch before. Uh, past the planet cement red line district with its rather sordid shanties and uh, homeless Gavandangan squatting around in between the railway lines. We weren't shielded from all this in any air conditioned car. We regularly got to see the area close up either from a fetch or from our Landretta later from. <coughs> I have a vivid memory of a homeless woman beside the tracks washing her hair with soap, only to have to do it again after a passing train belched. <laughs> Sort of all over. <laughs> I can't actually remember ever using a taxi in that entire year. Initially, we tried to manage by using Bedjak and muscles. We had a reg regular uh, Langanan Bedjak driver, uh, and uh, we're taught how to use the public bus system by David Mitchell. Thank you, David. <laughs> But once it, would be, it became clear that we'd be staying for a year, I was certainly fed up with arriving at my destination sweaty and covered with dust. So I bought a little red notice scooter, which made life much easier. <clears throat> it could still be a pleasure to get around my venture on some occasions. I have very fond memories of being driven home at night after attending the monthly Wayang Kuli performances of uh, Indonesian State Radio, NLD, uh, at the building on the northwestern corner of Medan Mateka, uh, but in the relative uh, coolness and still of the night, we were wheeled past <coughs> wilds which had radio broadcasting the music from the same airy performance we just played, and which still had hours to run and was natural. This was, of course, all in the days before mobile phones or the internet, or even photocopiers, let alone computers. I had a little holiday manual typewriter. We soon discovered that there were only a couple of houses in the complex that had telephones, and neither of them was working when we needed to phone a doctor. On another occasion, I used the phone in the local post office just around the corner. This was pretty inhibiting, because everyone else there stopped talking to listen to me. <laughs> It was possible, but inconvenient to make a more private call at the telecom office on the southern side of the Menon and that was probably uh, listened into by intelligence as well. In any case, there was better reception on international or long distance calls than on local calls, such as a call from that area to Tantra Kuyo. We were wary of the Indonesian postal system at that time, so often we asked travelers going to Australia to post our letters home there or even deliver them in person. We were frequent visitors to Kamara Airport to meet Jumpuk, some people, or farewell others, and give or titty them with something to take back to Australia. Few on the other will have vivid memories of one such occasion when he was robbed in the Kamara and Airports. After he checked in. After yeah. Letters from home were addressed to us chair of the Australian Embassy. We saw the Australian Embassy building before in Jalan Tanmin, that's where it was at the time. Uh, and we would pick them up at the Embassy building uh, uh, there. That was also an opportunity to use the Embassy swimming pool and to have treats like a hot dog, I seem to remember, and also ice cream. The economy was in a mess. There were dangerous holes on, in the roads and footpaths and manholes from which the metal lids had been removed. A naked or near naked man once looked up at me from one of these in the footpath near Serena Department School. A number of buildings in Jalan Tamri, Officer Hotel Indonesia, remained unfinished for a long time, like skeletons of probably rusting steel called girders. We had very little published information about Jakarta in those days, let alone something like a Google search. It would be some years before there were any guidebooks like those by Tony and Maureen Wheeler, Across Asia on a Cheap, Southeast Asia on a Shoestring, the predecessors of the Learning Planet Guides, or the Indonesia Do It Yourself book by Frank Palmas and Pat Price. They were all published in the 1970s. We had an Indonesian atlas which contained a very basic overall map of Jakarta. And the more detailed, the of the city, which promised you to the next book. There 
was also a small stencil shopping guide produced by the Australian uh, Embassy, which I still have. Um, so, well, they're heavily used. Uh, <laughs> but if that's what gave you, that's where you could go to do those things. Uh, one last anecdote, and then we didn't start. Again, one last anecdote, I couldn't go on with any more of the course, so before leaving Melbourne, we had sent two cabin trunks with household goods of various kinds ahead of us by ship and went by plane, unlike you and her. The ship, the Australia, was due to arrive at Tunchal Creole soon after we arrived. At that time, Tunchal Creole was notorious for its corruption. Bizarrely, I had no shipping papers for the trunks. With the help of some relatives of Berazari, uh, these relatives were in customs, I think it was, I was driven through the various roadblocks on the way to the docks, and we pulled up alongside the ship. Then it was up to me. I went aboard and made myself known to the ship's captain, and located the trunks and handed them over. And it was up to my friends who then drove me back uh, safely with the trunks. I didn't have to pay at any of the roadblocks, and my friends refused my offer to uh, recompense them. A few days later, Butler Rosari told me that he'd made a slight miscalculation, and he increased the amount we had to pay for our board in time to do. And sometime later, after we'd moved to Gagwaja, I received notification by way of the embassy from the shipping company to tell me that the ship and our trunks had arrived. <laughs> I was tempted to ask them to produce the trunks, but decided it was better to let sleeping dogs fly. And we can have a conversation or ask your questions or share your own anecdotes. That would be very welcome. I'm going to turn the lights up so that we can see everybody.
Yes, but those buildings are, are very much in existence. Of course, Yana in Monagoro, we have the, the what was the Central Zikan House, which is now the Lumasaki Chipalan and Sumo. Uh, that, that dated back to 1918, if I recall correctly. I think the Eichmann Institute is not out of next to it, or just behind it. Of course, I think it was 1928 or thereabouts, the, uh, the Harish, uh, too difficult for my poor judgment, the, the, the medical school, the, which was open and then became the medical faculty of Uli and Salema, of course, just round on the, the corner of the Monogoro and the Jalan Salema. Uh, you, you mentioned Medan Merdeka Salata, of course, that really has some of the best preserved uh, of the, uh, the, the Indi style uh, colonial houses. Um, of course, the, the one you mentioned uh, uh, was actually originally uh, a scientific institute. Uh, Back um, when the Batavia Kudunska, when the Batavia Society of Arts and Sciences decided not to focus on science, but instead to focus on linguistics and antiquities, uh, they set up a separate institute for sciences, and that was actually located pretty much in the centre uh, of Meta Salah. And of course, you've got the, uh, the official office of the vice president there now. Then you've got Ahok's office, the the um, uh, the official office of the, the governor of Jakarta. The, the, the director of the Javash Bank, uh, the, the Javash Bank was the, the central bank of Indonesia before it became Bank Indonesia in 1953. He also lived in Medan Medan one of those very fine homes there. So, fortunately, they've, they've now been, they've been saved. Was the, if you go to the east end of Medan Medan now you've got the, the new American embassy under, under construction. Uh, that's going to dominate the entire street, but still, fortunately, Medan Medeka Salata does have some very, very nicely preserved buildings, which uh, I'm sure will continue to be preserved. More comments or questions? Um, anecdotes, Ron, please. Um, So, so Belt Raiden 
um, was, was a very, very well-known term. And um, obviously, you still have memories of it. And um, uh, it became Batavia Centrum in about 1931, 1932. But certainly, Belgrade was a, was a very, very common expression, which you'll see in this stage of one um, for many of us who lived during that time, it's been a really lovely uh, trip down memory lane. My name's Ron Bitton. Uh, I did a BA at, and then an MA at Sydney University, and I first went to Indonesia in the end of first year university, so it was December 1962, by boat, um, so landed in Tanjung Priya um, and stayed in Mother Basar as a, an Australian, an Indonesian. <coughs> Students, family, and the students at the university who uh, got me interested in Indonesian language, and that's where my studies had started. But my memories of Jakarta at that time, if you went from Hotel Indonesia towards Kabaya and Baru, you still had rice fields on both sides uh, as you went. So it was rural to get to Kabaya and Baru. Um, uh, then later on, and, uh, I met um, people like Papakahia who had been in Australia, like the Bonham, had married an Australian, uh, went back and uh, was helping run Caltech. And so he gave me um, introductions to people like Papa Mutoyo in Palembang, uh, who adopted me, and I stayed with him, with a military commander of the armed forces for a while. But by the time I came back at the end of third year university, so that was in late 64, beginning of 65, um, uh, I flew in to Kamayaran, um, and by that time, first Beast was going to be my supervisor. He gave me an introduction to Molly Bondan, and she was wonderful in terms of providing materials about Sakano uh, and his speeches, which is what I was going to work on. Um, and indeed, I saw uh, Sakano speaking at Sanayan and Kukuki, Reminded me that we met there in uh, in 65 uh, or 60, late 64, 65, um, and then um, I was lucky enough to um, uh, get to meet Sakano for a breakfast at the palace. Um, just turned up a working breakfast, and lots of little things here. For example, to mention chocolate sprinkles on bread. That's what he was having for breakfast <laughs> um, in a, in a all the all parts of cabinets and diplomats and so on were all in their finery. He was in a kalsalam with a sarong, a ball. Uh, when I was when I was ushered in, I was looking around and I got pushed further and further and suddenly realised that the person I thought was perhaps a retainer of the munchers in the corner was actually for art as a panel and uh, sat next to him and so on. Um, the other person who was mentioned uh, was Frank Farmer. Uh, who presented his regret, regret in, in Vietnam and person otherwise he would definitely have come. He was a journalist in uh, Jakarta in the 65, um, and I do recall meeting him in the hotel in Malaysia. Um, he was, I think, modeled uh, for Year of Living Dangerously, the journalist in there was modeled on Frank Palmer. But I couldn't quite recall whether I dreamt this or made it up, but I checked with him and it was true. Before that, when I went up to his room in Hotel Indonesia, um, he used to turn the taps on. So he was sure that the place was bust, and this would make sure our, uh, our <laughs> conversation was not recorded. So that comment um, from Charles of uh, wondering whether your phone calls were being recorded was part of the paranoia of, uh, of this era. Um, I think that's more than most that I
leader at times of great political change. But no one has mentioned anything about the horrors of the 65, for example, the war. You know, the, the things that were happening in Indonesia while you were there. I mean, it's as though you didn't witness any of the atrocities or witness any of the. I mean, even I would think they would witness horrible things in Indonesia. But you've just glossed over all that. Well, well, the, the, the focus was urban dirty people. Yeah. But he, he was, he he was people seeing people. that too. Uh, what was uh, his reaction to those things that were happening then? Well, read the general biography and certainly get some of that. But can I add the same response to that? Um, what I was doing in Jakarta was uh, trying to do first graduate research on the situation of the Chinese at that time. And they were in an extremely difficult position yeah. at that period. Um, I didn't have any formal approval from uh, the, uh, the, the uh, research institute, which is the one I should have had. I managed to wangle in some way some kind of letter of authority from Professor Sellers and Martin, his institute. But uh, I was meeting people who were uh, uh, on the run, as it were, at that time, people who had relatives who had been uh, jailed or killed at the time of the violence in May 1965. Um, I didn't see it as my task to politicize what I was saying this evening about my experience of living in Chicago because most of my experience of living in Chicago had nothing to do with that other than that I had to steer a very careful course uh, to ensure that I could stay in the country and continue to do, yeah. do my research at that uh, And uh, uh, most of the worst of the violence that took place in 1965 took place a long way away from Jakarta in the villages, especially in central East Java and Bali, but also in parts of Sumatra and other parts of the archipelago. But it was overwhelmingly uh, a, a violence that took place in rural areas and one of the cities we've been talking about Jakarta. Is uh, we took uh, a lot of uh, how they looked, the earth and the people, and the earth traveled all the time. But that's at the end of 67 when we were staying, he was traveling to the uh, prisons, particularly at West Carolina, and then with us, um, visiting old friends that he knew when he worked in Chicago in the early 50s. It, when we got to Jogja, uh, I've been there a month before, but let me tell you. I've managed to reach the house of Professor Surya Lohi, who was the professor of Sosphora at that time, at that time. And he had to step down. It was too dangerous for him to be teaching Western oriented Tory books in the uh, sociology and politics. And uh, all the neighbors, uh, they, did, they lived in the back of the house, and we lived in the front of the house. And it was very difficult for them. And their children moved the house, they stayed with friends all the time. And a lot of the people that we met there uh, served in the singing and moved around from one house to the other. That's exactly what Charles said. You know, we, uh, we didn't see the very ugly things, he heard it. He visited his friends. Uh, suffering for me. There are many other stories at the moment about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In Indonesia, I remember when I was doing my research, he'd seen my first book and uh, he said he, as a small boy, he used to take the tram along Jalan Gajimala, but he and his friends were obviously all small boys at the time, would jump on the tram and wait till the conductor saw them and then jumped off again at the gate to see how far they could get along before uh, the conductor uh, kicked them off the tram. But you being very law abiding, I'm sure he paid his, uh, paid, his, paid his fare. Um, the, the, the tram started out as horse trams in 1869, um, but the death rate amongst horses was very, very high. And um, so they switched to uh, uh, steam trams. And uh, you're asking about the technology, I think, or the source of the power. Well, the, the steam trams started in 1884, and they were they were compressed steam. They were they were um, in, in near the Amsterdam Gate in Pasarica, or near Pasarica, there was a, uh, a device which could basically inject uh, 
compressed steam into what was a very, very large, which you probably called a gas bottle. And um, that way you didn't have to actually burn the thing as the train was moving along because the, the, the power came from the compressed steam. Oh, yeah. On each individual train. And um, there, there was one up in Pasarica and there was one down in Jatinagara. So the train would be able to travel all the way down from Pasarica to Jatinagara and then it would have to refill with compressed steam. Um, this was a very effective way of doing it because obviously if you were burning coal or burning wood on the train and the smoke was going behind it. There, weren't, there wasn't glass in the windows of the passenger cabin, so you would have been covered in soot. So it was rather interesting technology. The problem was, was that the, the compressed steam bottle uh, exploded. This would run like a, what you use in a barbecue today, instead of much bigger. You can see that there's photographs of my second book. Um, there was, in fact, an explosion, I think, around 1906. And, did quite a lot of damage, but they were surprisingly rare. The steam trams operated from 1884 to 1933, I don't know, and then for a while, from 1899 until 1962, they had electric uh, trams. So for a while, from 1899 to about 1933, there were steam and electric trams uh, in Jakarta, um, and they used to have overhead uh, lines just like you'd see in Melbourne now, so uh, from an electrical substation. Yeah, but, uh, pity we don't have that many more. Some Indonesians are nostalgic for them, thinking, well, where public transport is such a limiting factor now, getting around Jakarta, that yeah. if the trams were still there, would, would that help? Um, yeah. Maybe, but maybe they're taking a lot of space, I don't know, but, uh, but uh, they're not, not there with us anymore. Mm -hmm.